Digital is our new visual language. We are attracted to light. The technology, we can't let go of it. It's part of us now. We need art at the forefront of tech in order to create more humane culture. The Mars House is a showcase of how people can live with their screens. Samsung's always at the forefront of pushing the screen and how beautiful the aesthetics can be. Hi, I'm Noah Horowitz, Worldwide Head of Private Dealer uh, Gallery and Private Dealer Services at Sotheby's, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this special event today, which is part of Sotheby's Contemporary Conversation Series. Today's webinar is titled The Art of Curating and is presented in partnership with Samsung, Sotheby's partner for the New York Marquee Sales this November. Today, we'll be discussing some exciting recent developments in the curatorial field around modern contemporary art, focusing on the work of three extremely talented international curators. Joining us from London, we're honored to have, firstly, Mark Godfrey, uh, an art historian, critic, and curator. He was previously senior curator of international art for Tate Modern, where he co-curated the now seminal 2017 exhibition, Soul of a Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power, and was most recently organized retrospectives on Franz West and Olafur Eliasson. Welcome, Mark. Hello. Nice to meet you. Um, also from London, Eleanor Nairn. Um, she's curator at Barbican Art Gallery, where her exhibitions have included Jean Dubuffet, Brutal Beauty, um, this year, Lee Krasner, Living Color in 2019, and Basquiat, Boom for Real in 2017. Eleanor is also a writer for the art newspaper, the New York Times, and the London Review of Books, and was previously curator, curator of the Art Angel Collection at Tate, working with artists including Jeremy Deller, Mike Kelly, Tony Ausler, and Catherine Yass. Welcome, Eleanor. Hi, Noah. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, and lastly, joining us uh, from New York is Margot Norton. Margot is Alan, Alan and Lola Goldring curator at the New Museum. She joined the New Museum in 2011 and has recently curated exhibitions by Diedrich Brackens, Lynn Hirschman Leeson, Sarah Lucas, Micah Rottenberg, and Kari Upson, amongst others. And she's also co-curator with Jamila James of the 2021 New Museum Triennial, Softwater Hard Stone, which just opened a few weeks ago here in New York. Please do not miss this important um, exhibition of young art uh, in New York. Uh, so welcome, Margot. Um, Hello. So before proceeding, I'll, I'll hand over to Mark, who's going to lead today's conversation with Eleanor and Margot around their specific curatorial practices. Um, they'll speak for roughly a half hour and, and we'll round out today's panel with some broader questions and discussions for the final 15, 20 minutes. Um, so Mark, uh, over to you and, and the others and, and welcome everybody again from, from all over the world. Uh, thank you very much, Noah. And it's a real honor to be uh, on this panel with Eleanor and Margot. Um, I have really uh, enjoyed both of your exhibitions in, in recent months and I'm looking forward to talking with you both uh, and well amongst us in fact. So Eleanor just to start um, over the last few years I've seen shows that you've put together at the Barbican of uh, Basquiat, of Lee Krasner and Dubuffet um, and um, I was wondering you know I'm sure when, when you uh, make an exhibition like those you have to make an argument for why it's a timely moment to present these artists. They're, they're deceased artists, they're very important ones, they're ones that haven't maybe been looked at recently or looked at in the way that you want to look at them. So what, what sort of provokes you to put your hand up and say, I want to do a show by such and such an artist? Is it uh, to correct or to, to reinterpret them because of uh, a new art historical take? Or is it also because you think that they might speak to contemporary art in new ways? Thanks, Mark. So, I mean, broadly, I'm generally thinking about two things simultaneously. So I'm thinking about the building. The Barbican was built onto a blitz site. So we're built onto the, the ruins of the Second World War. And we opened in 1982. So the building has this history from sort of 45 to 82. And for those who are familiar with it, we are something of a, a brutalist behemoth. <laughs> so there's, there's no getting around the architecture. You know, it's not something that you can politely elide. So you need to think carefully about who are the artists who are really going to resonate in that space and whose work is really going to come into its own. 
And then you're very much thinking about the contemporary moment, which includes contemporary practice today and who are the artists who are going to feel really um, in dialogue with what we're seeing when we're doing studio visits and how can I approach their work as a curator and really kind of bring that to life. Um, so Basquiat was probably a good example of that, you know, of, of a show where I'm not somebody who's ever been very interested in white wall curating. Um, so this is the entrance to the exhibition and you can see that we had two things that you encountered as you first came in. On the right, you had this um, big blow up graphic, which has one of his uh, pieces of writing on the set for Downtown 81, the whole livery line bow like this with the big money all crushed into their feet. And you can just about make out, I think that there's a, a huge um, projected image onto the wall beside it, which is him dancing in the studio uh, to Duke Ellington's Riding on a Blue Note. So for me, these were two um, aspects of the opening experience, which both immediately you know, almost literally brought him to life. You know, we were very careful that that graphic on the right hit the figure is about five foot 11, which is the same height that Basquiat was. So really trying to sort of play with that uh, sense of being able to bring his spirit into the space. But they're also things that immediately give you access into important parts of his practice. And if we have a look at a, a couple of other images um, from that. So this, again, this was um, the first room of the exhibition. Um, this was New York New Wave. So this was really important to me that um, this was the New York New Wave happening in 1981, February 1981, organized by Diego Cortez, who sadly passed away recently and was a really kind of extraordinary thinker and curator and maker of things, you know, connector of people. And this was really the first time that Basquiat's work was seen by audiences in New York. So it was very important to me that, of course, now in 2020, you know, one, this was 2017 at the time, he's a known phenomenon. But, but to allow visitors to kind of encounter him the same way that if you were a young artist going to see this group exhibition in, in PS1, that's how you would have discovered him. Um, and also to enjoy um, the kind of the noise of having all of those works sat on hang, which was a recreation of how he had hung them in that original display. So again, getting away from very sort of precious ideas of, you know, I think of something like the recent Jay-Z and Beyonce Tiffany ad, um, you know, the ultimate of Basquiat being um, sequestered from a cultural sphere and being used for a luxury market or when we see perhaps one of his paintings spotlit in a kind of huge museum space. This was for me the kind of opposite gesture of saying, but at this point he was also a very young artist. You know, he was 20 at this point who had no formal training. Um, Can I pick you up on the word noise? Because um, one yeah, please. decision that a curator might make is whether to have a sort of soundless environment to show work in or to... Um, have music or the soundtracks of he was involved in 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 a band at one point what decisions did you make about noise within the space totally so yeah I'm really glad you asked that because I'm really interested in noise and bleed and I consider them to be um, natural extensions of the messiness of life and one of the problems that I have with the kind of modernist purist principles of white walled exhibition displays is that there is a kind of inherent racism which can underpin them and definitely a sense that they want to privilege certain people being able to feel comfortable in those spaces and very much at the expense of others. Whereas I feel like when we create exhibition spaces that are a little bit kind of, um, I guess I could use the word livelier in terms of, I quite often like to have overlay or uh, have different kinds of text or graphic or image. They not only provide different kinds of stimulation for visitors to the exhibition who perhaps might be interested in different entry points into the artwork, but for me, they also feel um, a bit more true to life and help people to feel, certainly I feel less self-conscious in those spaces. Now that said, you also want to make sure that you don't, you know, <laughs> make such a kind of cacophonous atmosphere, either either visually or orderly, that people are uncomfortable. So it's so it's a delicate balance. But I think if you get it right, it's like a really nice acoustic in a restaurant where the kind of low level thrum of other people in that space helps you to feel kind of at ease. 
In your Dubu Face show, um, you put his work um, on, on the walls at the same time as showing things that he collected. And how yeah. does that um, how does that sort of complicate the, 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 the model of the monographic exhibition? Yeah, so du Buffet, so I was kind of really interested with du Buffet in ideas of like subterfuge, you know, so um, you can see here a, a picture from the Lee Krasner exhibition I did in 2019, which in a way was a little bit cleaner in terms of mid-century aesthetic that was kind of playing on those mid-century American um, ideals. And then coming on from that, you can see du Buffet was... Um, it was really because he was so invested in notions of like good and bad taste. I was really interested in playing with that and also with materiality. So um, the paint colors were a very strong presence in the space. We worked with this incredible company, Bowerwork, who make these natural lime based paints. So um, you could see they were very, uh, very present, very unusual kinds of colors to hang works on. But then, as you say, we also had 16 artists from his collection of what he termed Art Brut. So for me, one of the reasons why I wanted to do the Du Buffet show was to have an excuse to be able to present the work of these incredible figures as well. Because, you know, Du Buffet was somebody who in 1945 was able to recognize the artists working in psychiatric care were real artists. Not that everybody in psychiatric care was an artist, but there, there were artists in psychiatric care who needed to be provided with proper materials and studio space and the conditions to be able to work. And he dedicated a lot of his life's energy to trying to make that happen. So for me, that's... Um, we did very small gestures as well, like we made sure that there was no, you know, booklet or guide for Du Buffet. There was only one for the Art Brute artists. So you came to see a show about Du Buffet and you left with a, you know, 16 page booklet about 16 other artists who may or may not have been your reason for, for coming that day. But again, sort of circling back to that question of contemporary practice, this is, you know, all part of how I try and make an exhibition of a French artist who was born, you know, 120 years ago, feel really relevant to 15 year olds from Barking and Dagenham who might be coming in to come and see the exhibition in the space. Just one more question. What you most recently made a show um, outside the Barbican that put together the work of Eva Hess and Hannah Wilkie. Mm -hmm. um, what was the reason to bring those two together? They're from slightly different generations of um, the New York art world. Yeah, it, it was, I mean, this was honestly like a real curatorial gift as a, as a project. Um, so I was interested in what happens when you stage a tete-a-tete. -tete. And I think this is something that, you know, both you and Margot have done in different kinds of instances. And certainly I'm sure Margot will be, have been thinking about a lot in terms of groups or combinations within the triennial. But, you know, sometimes you can allow... Um, two figures to be in conversation with one another in a way that's not interspersing the work or not indicating that they necessarily had a direct thread of influence, but is saying, here are two figures who were drinking from the same well. So what was interesting for me about this was Eva Husser and Hannah Wilkie are actually, you know, they're living and working in New York around the same time in the mid 1960s um, before Husser's untimely death. And and yet they're seen to be like on two different sides of this enormous chasm created um, by feminist politics. And so it, it was a real provocation in a way to say that actually Hesse's work possesses more absurdity and playfulness and levity than we often allow it to have because it's very easy and tempting to pathologize her practice because of the circumstances of her death. And Wilkie actually has a lot more kind of weight and psychological um, kind of underpinning and gravitas to what she's doing in her practice. But frankly, because she was so beautiful and because she used her own body and her own imagery within her work, people have sometimes found it difficult to take her as seriously. So they each had their own exhibition space. And I felt like... It was like the kind of balancing of a seesaw. They, um, you could leave each space uh, slightly touched by your experience of, of the other. Thanks so much. I think I, mean, I hope we can come back to some of those shows when we all talk together. But I'm going to turn to Margot now. And 
Uh, I was also, I, I unfortunately missed that Eva Hess Hannah Wilkie show because I wasn't in New York at that time. But the last I time I was, it was illegal to get in. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but I was. Um, I was lucky enough to see Margot's last show at the New Music, well, the last before the triennial, which was the um, retrospective of Lynn Hirschman Neeson. Uh, Hirschman Neeson. And, um, you know, Eleanor, you've spoken about working on, uh, w on exhibitions of artists who are deceased. Um, Margot, you, you chose to make an exhibition of someone who, um, quite a senior figure, someone who's been ma making work for decades but whose work very much speaks to many different generations of both artists and, and viewers in New York. What made you want to kind of put a spotlight on, on the work at this point in time? Uh, thank you, Mark. It's, it's interesting because I actually put Lynn in my thesis show in grad school um, and have been interested in Lynn's work for a very long time. Um, and I feel like she has been incredibly influential for uh, younger generations of artists, uh, even though she hasn't received uh, much institutional recognition at all. Um, this exhibition was actually her first museum show in New York, uh, which is quite surprising because she has had direct influence on so many artists through her teaching. Um, I you know, learned of her work in school myself, um, also in a lot of museum collections. She had a major retrospective that was held at the ZKM Center for Media Art uh, in Karlsruhe, Germany, that traveled to several institutions there, and then to the Yerba Buena Center for Art in San Francisco. But she hasn't had uh, any other uh, major exhibitions in the US besides that. So it was really an honor to get to put this show together and to introduce the public to uh, her work, which uh, we kind of developed this exhibition as a survey. Um, so it is spanning her entire career from the 1960s to the present on a very specific theme. Uh, so the title of the show is Twisted. Um, and the idea with the show is that uh, we uh, wanted to bring together works that are looking at a theme that runs throughout her practice, which is this intersection of technology and the self. Um, something that I think really resonates in this current moment. Um, and it's interesting even because her show was actually postponed a year. So it was meant to open in June 2020 and then opened in June 2021. Um, but it's incredible to kind of look back to this work. This is the first room of the exhibition, which includes work that she made uh, starting in the early 60s. Uh, so when she was very young in her early 20s. Um, and a lot of these drawings are exploring the figure of the cyborg. You know, many of them have these kind of details where you look inside at the inner machinery uh, of, uh, that she imagines within a body. Um, she also includes these, the, these breathing machine sculptures in the center of this room, which are works that incorporate sound and motion sensors. Um, they're casts of her face mainly that um, th when the viewer steps close to them, they are activated and almost come to life. And they're called breathing machines because they breathe. Uh, others of them laugh or some ask you questions. Um, but it's quite remarkable that she was working with sound and uh, motion sensors in the 1960s when it was you know, something that artists really didn't access uh, as, a, you know, part of their art making at that time. Um, I and imagine then, working with her that she was also very uh, enthusiastic about showing her most recent work and that must have been fun to sort of think about how to show what she's doing right now. Um, can you tell us a bit about that part of uh, curating the show? Oh, definitely, yes. I mean, Lynn is very active. She turned uh, 80 right before the show's opening. Um, and it's been, you know, it's, it's quite amazing like the, as you walk through the show to look at the dates of when she was working with various technologies. So, um, you know, even in the 80s, she was working with, uh, you know, touchscreen technology or the 90s, she was working with uh, artificial intelligence and net based projects. But most recently, she's uh, been exploring uh, actually DNA modification and the programming of the genome and incorporating that into this recent work. Um, she also developed a new project specifically for this exhibition, which was uh, titled Twisted Gravity, which is actually looking at a new technology that was just in its development stages 
for purifying water uh, due to different toxicities, mainly caused by uh, microplastics that are in water. And this new technology actually purifies the water and there's a lot of hope that's involved in that project. So uh, Lynn really took this opportunity to examine, take that project further. She collaborated with the Vice Institute at Harvard that are developing this new technology to purify water. And uh, it's, yeah, it was uh, also, uh, really incredible journey to kind of get a glimpse into that new technology and see how Lynn kind of works in tandem with these scientists on these new projects too. I mean, I did so many other questions I want to ask about that show, but just to move on to another exhibition that you did, or that you must have been planning at the same time as Lynn's show was up, which is the, the triennial soft water hard stone. Um, I haven't seen it yet, uh, but I've heard it's extraordinary. And um, I imagine that planning that during a pandemic must have been quite challenging, getting to know um, new artists' work, getting to think about how the work would look in space, maybe when you couldn't go into that space so often. How did you go about that? Well, it's interesting because I think we had this advantage of the show being a triennial. <laughs> so we were appointed the curators of the show back in the summer of 2018 and had about a year and a half of physical travel uh, doing research for the exhibition before the restrictions due to the pandemic were in place. Um, and so we had a bit of all and nothing in terms of our travel and really starting out at a breaknecking pace, you know, doing this research. And uh, I think we had like one trip scheduled per month um, up until, uh, you know, we, we were forced to continue the research at home. Um, we had actually developed the title and theme prior to the onset of the pandemic. So we had already this framework um, for the exhibition in place. And then it was actually quite efficient to finish out the research on Zoom. There were many trips that were canceled, unfortunately, and many places that we wanted to go and to be there physically. Um, but it's also interesting because Jamil and I were commenting that in, in many of our trips, we had laptop visits with artists who perhaps didn't have studio practices or they worked digitally or in video. Um, and so in, there were a lot of cases where, you know, kind of transitioning to Zoom was also, um, you know, it, it seemed kind of natural in a way. Um, but I do, it, it did make a big difference, I think, to have that physical research too. I mean, one of the really um, the big choices you make is how to who to put in the same space. Uh, so if we look at one of these installation shots, we're seeing different artists who may not know each other, who may not be in dialogue with each other, but who you're choosing to put in the same space. Um, just looking at the slide that's up right now, what choices were made about that? Certainly. Um, so the title of the exhibition is Soft Water, Hard Stone. Uh, it's based on a proverb uh, that we heard from an artist, Gabriela Mareb, who's based in Rio, uh, which is the full proverb is soft water on hard stone hits until it bores a hole. And she translated the proverb for us. It actually exists across cultures as well. Um, and it, it's said to have two meanings, one which is about resistance and perseverance and this impact that a small discrete gesture can have with time. And then the second one is about, you know, inevitable impermanence and change and the fact that time can destroy even the most perceptibly solid material. So it's an idea that's about, um, uh, you know, certainly has resonated a lot in our current moment, but was something that we were certainly thinking about even prior to the onset of the pandemic. So on this floor, actually, we, de we developed these sub themes that ran throughout each of the floors. So on the fourth floor, which has the largest, the tallest ceilings, we wanted it to be very bright and lit with as much natural light as possible. So the skylights are open and the windows are open. And this there's this idea on this floor of nature almost taking over. Um, and so uh, we were thinking a lot about on this floor about the regen regenerative capabilities of the natural world, um, kind of our inseparable relationship to it. Um, also artists that are addressing longer and slower timescales and engaging with and acknowledging historical traumas while also recognizing this adaptability of the natural world and its ability to persist. So uh, it includes in this slide a uh, work by an Argentinian artist, Gabriel Chayla, which is this kind of larger than life clay figure, which is modeled after a uh, 
pre-colonial ceram uh, ceramic figure, um, which then he's like blown up and anthropomorphized and given this new life uh, to, to this object. And then uh, in the center are sculptures by Brandon and Dife, which are definitely reference, you know, this idea of nature kind of taking over these domestic objects. Um, and on the back wall is a seven panel painting by a Baltimore based artist, Cynthia Deneau, which is called As I Lay Dying. And these are trees that are actually witness trees. So they're trees that have, uh, are actually the, the longest remaining uh, survivors of the Civil War in the United States. So within them kind of carry those traumas uh, of this you know, violent history, but also are incredibly strong and resilient and beautiful. Um, the new museum architecture is very particular. Some people love it. Some people find it very challenging. I mean, you've you've worked with artists who have used it in different ways, um, and uh, I remember um, Sarah Lucas's show being and the fantastic use of the height of those spaces. Um, what what led you to work with her? And can you tell us a bit about how she? Um, how she was using that space and the, causing people to look up and around as well as uh, at specific objects. Definitely. Um, so yeah, in 2008, uh, I co-curated an uh, exhibition, Au Naturel, of Sarah Lucas's work. I uh, co-curated the exhibition with Massimo Nogioni, uh, who's our artistic director at New Museum. And um, we worked very closely with Sarah on the selection of works and the installation. Um, so it, also with that exhibition, it's true that we wanted to give like a different mood to each of the floors. You know, the new museums almost organize like this layer cake. And so each, each of the floors definitely feel very distinct. So this is an image of that same floor that we just saw with the triennial, um, with a giant wallpaper of a, uh, actually one of Sarah Lucas's first self-portraits, uh, which is called Divine from 1991. And, you know, we had this idea to blow up that uh, kind of it, very early image of her uh, kind of domineering over <laughs> the, the fourth floor of the museum uh, with this, you know, big expanse of sky uh, behind her. Um, and uh, at the foreground is actually a, uh, a new work that she made for the exhibition, which is this severed uh, jaguar that she meticulously covered in cigarettes in the front and then in the back uh, kind of torched and, and burned. Um, and, you know, there was d definitely this play with the architecture of the space and, you know, this pushing up against the space too. Actually, uh, in the following image, there is an installation of the third floor of the museum um, with uh, all of her nuds kind of came together <laughs> on this floor. There are these, um, you know, stuff stocking uh, works that she also cast in bronze for uh, installation in Venice. Um, and then behind them is a work uh, which is called 1000 Eggs for Women, um, which was actually a, an action that we staged at the museum where we got 1000 eggs and then brought women, people who identified as women into the galleries as well as people dressed as women um, to kind of toss those eggs onto the wall um, in the back of the of the gallery uh, here. So um, yeah, it was a, this is actually a, an interesting image to bring up your collaboration with, with Sarah Lucas, Mark, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear a bit about that um, process. I know that you uh, worked with Sarah Lucas on the exhibition design for your Franz West ex exhibition. And I know we were just kind of talking about uh, this coupling of artists with Eleanor's exhibition of Hannah Wilkie and uh, Eva Hess. And I, I love that. Um, uh, you know, dialogues that exist between those artists. It was an incredible exhibition, Eleanor. And uh, Mark's, yours too, you know, had this uh, beautiful dialogue between Sarah Lucas and Franz West, who I know were friends and collaborators as well. Um, so I wanted to ask you if, if you uh, would, would speak a little bit about like what was the impetus for you in inviting Sarah to collaborate with you uh, on the exhibition design for that show and to, to bring them in dialogue in such a way. Sure, well, um, you know, I was working uh, with Christine Marcel at the Pompidou on a retrospective of Franz West that would be shown both at the Pompidou and at the Tate. And um, I felt that, you know, Franz West was such an amazing uh, disruptive spirit, but he wasn't there and, um, I wanted to find a way of, of presenting his work in a way that would be sort of appropriate to his, his way of working on exhibitions. 
So I thought to ask Sarah, also because this show was being uh, held in London and Sarah is an artist whose career begins in London and she was good friends with him. So um, I thought to ask her also to, to deal with all the most boring things about presenting sculpture in a museum. So um, the walls behind sculptures, the pedestals, the plinths, and also importantly, the stanchions, because at the Tate, <laughs> you have to put rope barriers behind everything. And she came up with this incredible proposal to, well, to use the kind of MDF and breeze blocks that she'd used with her own work, for instance, in the installation that you just showed. Um, but she also took Franz's most commonly used colors, so a yellow, a green, a pink, and a baby blue, and she painted the stanchions in those colours. She actually wrapped them with um, masking tape and then painted over the masking tape. And also we used coloured cord. Uh, and the work seems to have kind of come alive through this, this dialogue. She had made exhibitions with West, but this was in a way her taking responsibility for showing his work. Um, my choice was which works to exhibit. Um, pretty much where to put them in the room, but her choices were to do with um, the, the scenario. Um, I also was interested in the way, as you've showed, that she has sometimes blown up huge images of her own work as wallpaper to create a whole environment. And I was worried about well, how does one exhibit Franz West's outdoor sculptures? So sort of work, I thought, well, working with Sarah would give the permission to do something to Franz West's work that I didn't really feel permission for unless working with Sarah. And that was to do these huge wallpaper blow ups of images of his outdoor sculptures. And then to, for instance, position some of his, so his sofas in front of them. So it was kind of a, a really exciting way to collaborate with her. At another point in the exhibition, she threw, um, he'd also done works involving throwing eggs against walls. <laughs> and she um, threw one of his eggs against the walls. And then in the final space of the exhibition, uh, we presented a film of Sarah and Franz in dialogue. Well, this is actually, what you're seeing here is Sarah and another artist, Andreas Reiteraba, um, in one of the cha his chairs, looking at one of his last works. Uh, a work, by the way, that became sort of in the first days of coronavirus, everyone would put this on their social media to say that Franz West had anticipated the, the word coronavirus. But the last space in the exhibition, um, we, we showed a film that, the two, that, that had been made by Sarah's uh, boyfriend, but that showed the two of them in dialogue together. And it's a sort of two artists talking to each other, but going back to Eleanor's uh, ideas about noise, um, half the time you can't hear what they're saying to each other because um, their, their dialogue is drowned out by an experimental musician who was playing on stage as they were talking. So I just felt that um, working with her gave great permission to do things that I might not have um, felt a license to do on my own. That feels like an interesting question maybe about why we sometimes need artists to uh, give us permission to be doing these kinds of curatorial gestures. Sometimes that's something I wonder about. You know, one of my favorite shows in London was Dora Lorwu's uh, show at the Camden Arts Centre, Making Our Making, which was a f just included a sort of completely fantastic range of painters and sculptors and um, artists working with textiles and, uh, and a, you know, shown in a really kind of immersive vein in terms of the installation and I remember coming away from it and thinking you know I, wa I wonder if I would ever allow myself to do some of those kinds of gestures and I think um, we've seen that with a lot of exhibitions where artists have been invited to intervene with a collection for instance where we're very happy for them to make some very unexpected juxtapositions within the collection in a way that um, maybe we need to allow ourselves to do more or allow other kinds of creatives to also do? I, mean, I'm, I, I agree with you. I think that um, in institutions particularly, maybe not in the new museum, but in some more, um, uh, some, you know, in institutions with collections perhaps, there's a sort of self-policing that goes on. Mm -hmm. But you feel you have to do something in a certain way 
because if you don't do it in that way, you could be um, accused of trying to steal the limelight from the artist or from the works that you're showing by intervening too much with your curatorial voice. And that's why I felt that um, you know, working with Sarah would give permission to do things that I was hoping to do anyway. But you're right, it would be great to see people having more confidence to be, to be creative about the spaces they're and maybe, more, um, and maybe more play. I mean, in a way, it's a nice entree into your um, exhibition with Laura Owens in, um, alongside Van Gogh, because, you know, what, what Laura could do in that kind of combination is, um, is extraordinary. And for me, visually, really exciting. Um, but it's would also be... exciting because they were of totally different lifetimes too, right? So mm -hmm. it's like kind of this bridge intergenerational. Them. I mean, it was an, really interesting. I, I had invited Laura, I, I was working with Beecher Kuriga and we invited Laura to make a show at the Fondation Van Gogh with the idea simply that the two, uh, her work and Van Gogh's work would be shown together. And Laura's first concern was how do you create spaces that are dark enough for the needs of Van Gogh paintings. You can't have bright lights shining on Van Gogh paintings, but that also could accommodate her work and her work's usually shown in brightly lit white cube spaces. And her proposition was to create giant wallpaper painting installation that would go, that, that Van Gogh's would sit on um, and that would somehow create the conditions for looking at the Van Gogh's as paintings again, rather than as sort of mythical products of a legendary artist's work. But what um, was more, even more fascinating was how she derived the, um, the, the imagery for the wallpaper. She discovered a portfolio of drawings by a, a, an unknown British designer who was working about 100 years ago who was working therefore about 20, 30 years after Van Gogh, who um, never realized any of the designs, but made just a series of small drawings uh, during uh, studying art at the Hornsey School of Art in the middle of World War I. And Laura found this portfolio and then took all the designs and essentially transformed them to generate the different kind of um, patterns that you see in the wallpaper. But she, she also worked in a very complex way with printing the wallpaper um, using both hand painted elements and digital printing, silk screening, all sorts of things. But it just became, I thought, an environment where people could see the Van Gogh paintings as paintings, mm. um, which was pretty interesting. It looks outrageous in the best possible way. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. I, and I have to say it was, you know, I take no credit for how it looked. I, I and Beecho, we, we gave her the, mm. the invitation to do this, but she, how the thing turned out is just entirely due to her genius, I think. Yeah, I, think I mean, that's, I that's a, oh, go, go for it, Eleanor. No, I was just going to say, I think sometimes that's a curator's role. It's just to get out of the way and to know when you're needed and know when you're not and know when to extract yourself from the conversation and, and when not to kind of over, overly impose your own ideas on a project. That's, I think, a very beautiful curatorial gesture to know how to do as well. Yeah, and, and I, I guess I would only add from my, sense, or from my side rather that, um, you know, I, I didn't see the show, but what's so beautiful, Mark, about what you were saying is not only does it allow you to see Van Gogh through fresh eyes, but that wallpaper gesture and that the act of printing in the way that that Laura clearly went around it is is also totally integral to her practice. It's not it's not decorative per se. It's it's actually totally in sync with how she creates um, her work. I mean, maybe um, uh, just to sort of bring that through because I think in a way it it offers a nice point for reflection to the three of you. Um, you know, which is really and, and, and returns at some level also to, to sort of the curatorial avant-garde really thinking about these practices. Maybe, maybe a, a broader question to be posed to each of you individually is, you know, were there particular exhibitions that you or was there a particular exhibition that each of you either saw or studied that was really f formative to your own decision to choose 
this path that really help shape and, and guide your intellectual formation and, and, and direct your, your, your eventual moves into this space. Margo, you're, you're smiling. So maybe, maybe you want to, you want to take the lead on that. Well, it's interesting because I was thinking about how actually some of my most formative experiences were not in museums, in fact, um, but in artist run spaces and alternative spaces in New York. Um, because when I was actually 13, I had a poetry teacher who took our class downtown. We'd go to Soho and we'd go to like Exit Art and Art in General. And I remember going to even New Museum when it was on Broadway and seeing a lot of uh, a lot of group exhibitions. You know, this was also like the early 90s. So there was a lot of work about identity and a lot of, you know, more diverse voices that have entered the conversation at that point. Um, and just being really inspired by so much of what um, was happening in these spaces and connecting to the artistic activity in New York at that time. Um, and, you know, that yeah, though I, I do feel like those earlier experiences, seeing those shows were very uh, influential for me. I actually took an internship at Exit Art after graduating from undergrad for that reason. Uh, and, and that experience was extremely formative for me in terms of uh, kind of developing, uh, you know, the pathway that I eventually took. Mark? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know exactly what made me want to be a curator. I was um, studying art history, uh, doing a PhD, and my research took me to New York. And while I was there, I had sort of all the weekends to myself. And um, I went to the Deer and saw Lynn Cook's shows uh, that were sort of the end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s. And basically everything she did, I thought, was <laughs> as high a standard as one could ever get to, because uh, the spaces looked absolutely incredible. The work was allowed to speak for itself. Um, and there were these immense publications that with, you know, brilliant scholarship. So I thought this was, she'd obviously worked with the artists to get them to um, make the most ambitious projects they could with the space and with uh, a sort of discourse around the work. And that for me remains the model really. I was, I was going to say something very similar to Margot, actually, which was that um, I think some of my most formative experiences were outside of arts institutions, which I don't think I'd fully registered and, you know, until I was thinking about it recently. And um, particularly when I then went to go and work for Art Angel, which I took up that job when I was 23 and they were advertising for somebody who would look after their collection. And I said, well, you know, I've seen all of these projects since I was a child and probably the only reason why I was willing to go to those projects as a child is because I didn't categorize them as art. It would be like, okay, so this woman has cast an entire, you know, Victorian terraced house out of concrete. You want to come see it? It's in the East End. Okay. <laughs> like, you know, they were things that felt um, exciting and unusual and they were experiences and it didn't, they were experiences that weren't, didn't need to be categorized with a capital A art. And that's probably why I'm still so interested now in investigating ways in which exhibitions can announce themselves in a kind of lowercase way so that people don't feel so kind of overwhelmed or bombarded by those aspects of being in an institutional space that it inhibits them from just being able to like get up close to the work and think about what the artist is doing, think about what the artist got wrong, thinking about what kinds of mistakes they made. Again, that was one of the reasons I was so excited to do the Dubuffet show was that I think he was the artist who most frequently came up for me in studio visits with the broadest range of figures. And it's because he says, put the things you love in peril, you know, and people, artists, artists love to see other artists who are willing to jeopardize the things that would be precious to to another that's really beautiful i i i was in london in the early 2000s and very distinctly remember a few really impressive art angel commissions that you know for my part were for i think it was like matthew varney moment there was some steve mcqueen it was right after rachel white reed's famous project in the east end so it's it's really beautiful to to talk through and and see how these these various projects have influenced you guys um, I guess Margot touched on this a little bit in her response um, or, or her comments earlier, just around 
Um, you know, we're, we're speaking in, in early mid-November now. We're, we're kind of finally, uh, the, the borders to the U.S. just opened to international uh, visitors within the last day. Um, it, it's been a trying year and a half. I mean, Mark, Eleanor in particular, I just, just talk a little bit because I think our audiences would be interested in, in hearing your own perspectives. And, and Margo, if you want to add further, you know, just how it's been working as curators um, uh, through the pandemic, um, because you, you know, clearly have, have, you know, traveled the world so much over recent years, spent a lot of time in artist studios. There's a real tactile um, uh, uh, skill that goes through seeing and experiencing and, and ultimately for, for your part, processing work and, and repositioning it. Just, just talk to our audiences a little bit about how, how this has been and, and, you know, if there have indeed been some interesting um, and, and maybe unexpected upsides as a result of, of, of this, of this time. So, um, I, okay. <laughs> so I would say, um, I, I would say it's been an unremitting nightmare. So I'll leave Mark to do the kind of bright lights and upsides because um, I, I mean, I'm a completely analog curator. So I like to work on models. I visit every painting before I request for it to be in a show. I like to go and meet with every lender, every artist. I, I really just believe in human contact and conversation and things that can happen in person. And I believed in that very passionately before I knew how uh, threatened those values were going to be. So I was lucky in a way that um, the exhibitions that I was delivering at that point we're in a delivery stage so a bit like what Margot was saying you know I'd done most of the research and um, lender visits for Dubuffet I still had Lee Krasner on the road as well so I was helped in that regard but my one silver lining would be letter writing I couldn't go and see people in person so I started writing letters to people and it's you know these days when people are just so no one wants to read things in their inbox but not many people sit down and put a pen to paper and remember to say thank you or what it meant to have been allowed into someone's home. Um, and I think sometimes I'd say the best, the best things that have come about in my shows have, have maybe been thanks to a like well-written letter. So that's, that's my kind of ode, ode to the analog in a very digital mm -hmm. moment. What about you, Mark? You were gonna speak. Um... Yeah, I, I remember when, when the pandemic hit, uh, I um, thought that what, what I could do was do studio visits by Zoom. And for a while, it was quite liberating. So any artist that I thought I was interested in, who normally I would have traveled to see, I, I DM them on Instagram. And I, I met Candice Williams, for instance, or Tiana Nakia McClodden. Um, but these were people uh, I met um, Matthew Angelo Harrison. These were artists based in Detroit and Philadelphia and Zurich and artists. I, I felt it was great that I could kind of do these studio visits without leaving this very chair. Um, <laughs> but then um, in the summer of 2020, when we were in a sort of dip between the first and second wave, at one point I realized that the rest of the autumn or the fall was going to be really horrible so I took myself to Berlin for five days and basically spent uh, with with no mission I wasn't curating any of these artists but I just knew them all I wanted to I went to see Wolfgang Tillmans, Tassa Tadine, Petrit Halilaj, um, Christine Sun Kim um, and a couple of others just simply to sort of spend time with artists in a way that I then didn't for about six months in the second um, in the second lockdown and I felt that was how I negotiated. I really did at one point really want to be in artists' studios with them. All along that time, I was curating another show with Jacqueline Humphreys, and it was very frustrating to be making a show with a painter without being able to see any of the surface. And so, you know, as Eleanor says, mo most of the time we like to have a look at the things we're going to put on the walls, but it was impossible and, uh, until the show went up. And actually, one of the pleasures was that I got to see um, a lot of the work for the first time in five or eight years uh, at the point of installing a big exhibition. So there was a sort of hidden treat for me because I have not <laughs> been able to see the work in, in, in the research phase. And, and Margot, any, anything else to add from your side? 
Um, no, I, I, I completely agree that there's really no substitute for seeing art and experiencing it in person. Um, again, you know, at the start of the pandemic, there was this like outpouring of digital programming that was taking place. And in a, in a lot of ways, it's been, uh, you know, also more accessible, like, you know, programs like, like this, for example, uh, in terms of the, you know, reaching an audience that's far greater than you could in a typical auditorium. Um, but, you know, it, there's also this, um, I think, you know, especially with doing these studio visits online and seeing all, that whole experience of working on the triennial and seeing so many of these works digitally. Um, and, and you can probably sense this from the images of the show that it really felt like materiality was key and what those artists were exploring and what we were interested in um, and how those works also can shift and change in the physical space. Um, and also, in, you know, with the presence of the viewer, which is, which is the point. Um, and so it almost seemed like an antidote in a way to be able to have these works in the physical space and to, uh, especially considering the amount of time that we're spending on screens uh, and that we were, you know, working with artists that were producing works that demanded a slower pace and a, and a deeper kind of engagement. Um, and that, you know, experience of being with those objects was, was incredibly powerful. Cool. Well, we're, we're nearing the end, um, so I'd, I'd like to maybe um, uh, not, not just the end of the, the talk, but but the end of the year. And and with that having been said, um, and and with an exciting year ahead, both with Venice and and Documenta and, and many other um, things to look forward to um, next year as we come out of this moment. Uh, maybe just pose a final question to the three of you, um, which is, what are you most looking forward to as, as you scope into 2022? Well, I'm going to get to New York uh, at the beginning of 2022, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the new museum triennial. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thank Mark. You. <laughs> Oh, was that to me? Sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. I, uh, I was too busy laughing at Mark's good joke. But I think, you know, both Mark and I um, have a great research interest in, in, in the post-war and contemporary American art. So I think we're both probably similarly like pining to make it over to the United States. For, I mean, for me, the show that I feel like I've been waiting a lifetime to see is the Joe Mitchell show. Um, which is currently in San Francisco, but I, I think sadly I might not make it to the West Coast, but it'll be in Baltimore next spring and um, Sarah Roberts and Katie Siegel have co-curated that. It's been an absolutely epic research project that's gone into it. It's got an incredible catalogue and um, yeah, I think it's going to be real kind of nourishment for the soul to see that number of her paintings. So yeah, that's what I'm psyched about. And I have the inverse being here in the US and looking forward <laughs> to going to, to UK and Europe. And I, uh, you know, deeply want to experience the Turbine Hall Commission with Anika Yi that you curated, Mark. That looks incredible. Um, and also, you know, of course, the Venice Biennale that Cicilia Alamani will be curating in uh, the spring of 2022. Um, I'm sure that that will be uh, amazing. So, yeah, can't wait. Well, 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 thanks um, so much, Mark, Eleanor, Margot, um, for your contributions today um, to Sotheby's and Intelligence Squared for putting all of this together. Uh, if you're in New York next week, please do visit um, Sotheby's marquee sales, uh, including our now evening auction uh, of contemporary art next Thursday, the 18th. Um, and for those joining from around the world, I really hope you enjoyed uh, the discussion. Thank you again, um, um, Eleanor, Mark, and, and Margot. Bye from New York. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Right. Digital is our new visual language. We are attracted to light. The technology we can't let go of it. It's part of us now. We need art at the forefront of tech in order to create more humane culture. The Mars House is a showcase of how people can live with their screens. Samsung's always at the forefront of pushing the screen and how beautiful the aesthetics can be.